Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Commercial Construction Elevate the Industry podcast series hosted by yours truly, Dave Presida. Thanks for joining us today. The reason for the podcast is twofold. I want to introduce you to industry leaders who I've met and helped influence me and shape their business so their stories might empower and inspire you. At the same time, give you some technical advice from my personal experiences that would help you get from where you are to where you want to go. Today's episode focuses on sales and acquisitions, and my goal is to teach you the nuances of either selling or buying a construction business. But we're going to focus on the construction business, and and it's different. If you have a retail business and you know what your sales are for that month, it's a cash basis. You sold $100,000 for the month and you got $20,000 in inventory. You know what you're worth at any point in time. There are two things that make construction business much, much different, and that's accounts receivable and work in process. And as we go through today's episode, I'm going to explain why they matter. Now, why would somebody sell? There's a lot of reasons. And and someone once said, there are as many reasons that people would sell as there are owners of businesses. I'm one of them. I sold my business. And I was young at the time, and I sold it because I wanted to change And I wanted the cash. It changed things for me. It could be retirement for somebody else. It could be uh, failing health or a health of a spouse. Uh, It may be just the changes in risk tolerance. Maybe you're sick and tired of having all your money out on the street. And for you business owners, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But we'll get into why uh, and more so uh, we're going to talk about how. So let's talk exit strategy. Most business owners think about it, but they don't really plan. FMI, Fails Management Institute, estimates that the average construction owner has over 75% of their personal net worth tied up in the business. Now, that sounds crazy, uh, but it's true, and we'll explain why. There's three, re- there's three ways to get your money out of the business, as far as I'm concerned. The first being winding the business down. Now, what does that mean? How do you wind a business down? Well, it's simple. You don't take any new work, so you're not selling anymore, and you finish what you have. You pay your vendors and you collect your money and you keep your equity. Here's the problem. You're going to face situations like accounts receivable. Average company, $10 million in volume will have two and a half million plus or minus in accounts receivable. Money out on the street that your customers owe you. Not everybody will do this, but some will. They're going to give you what's called a haircut. So you're not going to collect all your accounts receivable. Um, change orders, a typical $10 million company at any point in time will have at least a half a million dollars wrapped up in pending change orders. Now, what's a change order? That is what you see as the difference between what your client bought from you and what they're asking you to do. You're considering it a change and there's, and they may say yes or no, but you're in a much weaker negotiating position if your client knows that This is the last job they're ever going to do with you. You have a risk of losing your staff, your key staff. If they know you're wanting a business down, they're not going to stick around. They might for a little while, but they're going to be looking and people are going to hear about it and they're going to hire away your staff. That's normal. And you're probably going to wish them well, but it's not going to make it any easier. So these are just some of the things that you're going to face when winding down a business. And how do I know that? I had to do it. Back in 1992, I had six companies under one umbrella and I had to wind three of them down. One was bad, two were just okay. The rest were really good. But winding the business down cost me a lot of money for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And almost more than that, it sucked the life out of me. So I would strongly recommend that you don't wind your business down. So the second way to get your money out of the business would be an internal sale. And an internal sale is just that. It's selling your business to people who are already in it. Your managers, for example. Uh, It's a great way to do it. uh, And it's very common, but it's not always that simple. It's underscored by the fact that the business, the health of the business has to be put first. All right. So if you want a good sale, you have to have a good business, right? If your business is failing, it's going to be a failing sale. So the health of the business is always in the forefront. Remember, an internal sale is is one that the business funds. So I did it. 
right? I did it way back when I had partners. I was a minority owner, but I was the guy driving the business and I had some guys invest in me and I had to buy them out. So I did, basically they did an internal sale. I was the buyer. At that time, I went to the bank and did a leverage buyout, which really only came up with the cash needed for the down payment. The rest of the payments were made over three years and it had to come out of the funds of business. So when you think about an internal sale, you got to have a good management team that's ready to do it. And the management team has to be capable of um, managing a successful business, right? Because if they don't and the business goes down the tubes, so does the sale, so does any money that they owe you. Some considerations, you're probably going to get less money down because the company can only afford a certain amount. Remember, the company with the cash flow has to has to make payroll every week. They have to pay vendors. They have to finance the accounts receivable. So they can't take $2 million of accounts receivable and give it to you. That happens over time. So typically, you're going to get less down and it's going to be a longer term, which may suit you. You may not want to get out of business for five years, which gives you time to to both groom uh, and acclimate people to, to do the job that you're doing now. Uh, if you want to get out sooner, probably not the best way to go. It'll typically be a stock sale. Now, this is a big deal because, and, and, and I want to advise everybody right now that I am not an attorney and I am not an accountant. I am a contractor who's been through it all. Whatever happens today and whatever you hear, make sure you run it by your accountant and your attorney. I'm just giving you what my experiences are. But a stock sale, what's the difference? A stock sale is great because you're selling stock, you get better tax benefits from selling stock, and you're gonna be able to uh, you know, get, again, the different tax treatment, but it's gonna take longer. Now, stock sale means that the buyers, the managers are accepting all the liabilities in the company. And that's good because you're, you're doing this at that point in time, but they're not, they're not afraid of it because they've been in the business. They know, they know the risks involved and they're willing to do it. So you got to shape that sale with how much the, the business can afford to get to you. You got to shape it with how much, if any, the managers can come up with. And then, of course, it's borne out over time. I will say this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time today talking about internal sales. But in a future episode, you're going to hear from a best-selling author on the topic, national speaker, an industry leader in internal sales who are going to tell you why, for example, you shouldn't gross up the salary of the seller just to get money to them. That's the worst thing you can do. They'll explain why and a whole lot more. And I'm sure you'll be excited to see that and hear that uh, episode. External sales. External sales is, I've been involved in over a hundred million dollars of external sales. Uh, in my career, both by buying a business, selling a business, and then being involved in an M&A team for a public company that did several. Typically, an external sale is just what it is. It's selling it to an outside source. It could be another company. It could be a competitor, private equity firm, or a national contractor. Those are typically the businesses that would buy your company. Why would a competitor buy you? Well, because they're buying you to get you out of the market. They might want your staff. They might want to enter the market you're in, right? And trust that you're a good contractor. So they would buy your business. Typically, competitors uh, will not give you a whole lot of money down because they don't have it. Uh, they don't want to risk it, number one. Number two is it's going to be more of a partnership agreement. They're going to want you to stay on as a minority partner so you have skin in the game. And most of your income will probably come from an earnout. Right? If you do good, we do good. There'll be a window of time and it's not a bad way to go, but that's that's one type of, of sale. Private equity firms are different. They have a lot of money, but they don't want to give it to you. <laughs> they typically want to buy a company. They want to shrink the overhead, maximize the sales, leverage it whatever way they can, and in three to five years, resell it for a multiple more than they bought it for. Typically, they're going to offer you a, a menial deposit it's going to be just like the competitors. They're going to say, look, join us, stay as a partner. We want you, we love you and all that stuff. But they want you there because they need you there. They're typically not industry people. Your competitors know the business. 
Private equity firms don't. They'll talk to the consultants like me and ask about the industry you're in. They don't know your industry, so they're going to need you. Uh, and that's a whole different ball game. But again, they're going to want you to stay on. It's going to be pretty much of an earnout based total compensation package. That also has tax implications. We're going to focus on national contractors, big public companies who are in your space. What I mean by that is they're companies that are doing what you do. They're probably the best bet to buy your company because A, they have the money. B, they typically don't want you to be a partner. They want to own the business. That's just their business model. And it's certainly, it happened to me. It was okay by me. Three, they can afford more down, but probably give you most of it in one spot. Imagine getting money wired from their account to your account on the day of closing. They don't owe you anything. You don't owe any stock. And you have a deal after the fact. But these are typically companies that are large. They want to be able to buy you because, for example, an insulation business. If you're an insulation contractor and you get one of these big public companies, they buy, I don't know, 100 times more insulation than you do and they buy 30% better. So if they took what you did and didn't change a thing and just got the results of the buy, their return on investment is much, much quicker because they leverage the buys. Also, they understand the business. So there's, there's other leverage with parts and pieces and management and so on. So they're a good source for buying. And we're going to focus basically on how that works. Elevate, 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 elevate. So you might ask yourself, what do potential buyers value when looking at rolling up or, or acquiring a business? And whether it's a private equity firm or a national contractor, it's the, the fundamental thing is, are you making money? EBITDA, right? Earnings before income taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Are you making money? If you are, you're, you're a target right off the bat. If you're not, you're probably looking at an internal sale, which, you know, isn't the end of the world, but you're not going to get a buyer um, that way. They're going to look at the management structure. Why does that matter? Well, they're, they're going to deal with you until you don't want to deal with them anymore. And sometimes that's, that's soon and sometimes that's later. They got to look at what's behind you. Have you groomed managers? Now, when I first got involved in uh, acquisitions, I would say, you know, we want to stay away from multiple divisions because they're all spread out. And then I thought about it. I said, no, it's probably one of the one of the great things you can do because think about it. Multiple divisions have different managers. They manage that unit. And that's even better. But to look at the management structure, if you leave, who's behind? It's not if, it's really when you leave. Uh, who is behind you? The second thing is, are you scalable? In other words, if they put their assets into your business financially, uh, marketing-wise, otherwise, are you going to be able to grow in that market? That's just you know being able to scale up. Now, I got to tell you, I was involved in, a, in an acquisition many years ago, part of the M&A team of a big public company who bought a contractor, the biggest guy in a small market. Not only was it a small deal, so small deals from an M&A perspective take as long to do as a big deal. They do. So there's no time savings. It's just less money, but all the due diligence is, is the same. And they couldn't grow. So they're buying a business that's pretty much peaked out. That made no sense to me. So if you are in a market and you have uh, the ability to grow, but you're not growing because you just don't want to risk the financing, whatever it is, that's a good thing. They'll look at that scale and they'll say it's favorable. Are you open shop or union? I, I know two buyers, as a matter of fact, that one is union and open shop and the other is strictly open shop. They don't want to have anything to do with the union. That's just the way they're built, their culture. So they'll look at that. National contractors in particular who are in the business are going to look at what you do every day, your lines of business. You might have two, three, four, or five. And if they align, your lines of business align with the same ones the national contracting firms are, then you are even a bigger target because they not only know what you do, they can scale what you do, right? And they can leverage what you do. To look at your marketplace, right? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? You know, union, union companies now get looked at a little different than they did 15 years ago. I swore that I would never see non-union companies, open shop companies working in Manhattan. And this was, you know, 15 years ago. Well, guess what? It's changed. The downturn changed everything. Now, open shop companies are all over the place. So what does that mean? That means the union market is shrinking. 
doesn't mean if you're a union company, you can't sell it because we, we do it. It happens. But these are some of the things that the uh, buyers will look at. They'll look at your, you know, how you're built and your market. One of the biggest things, and it's an intangible one, is can I work with the seller? So imagine yourself buying a business or even hiring, like you hire people every day, right? You hire people based on their, their background, their skill set, and the perception of whether you can work with them or not. It doesn't matter how good they are, and it doesn't matter how much money you make. If the company can't work with you, if they don't see a work of a relationship, it's not going to help. And I haven't seen too many owners that I would describe as not being able to work with. Doesn't let me say it that way, but it's important. So they're going to want to know, uh, can I work with you? And again, the magical thing, who's behind you? So you're considering selling your business. You have to ask the question that everybody asks. What's my business worth? I can tell you right off the bat, it's worth what the buyer thinks. <laughs> and as difficult as that may sound, it's true. You know, I've had, I've had, Deals go south because the buyer and the seller couldn't reach an agreement. It happens all the time. But I can give you some basic parameters on how it's valued. Your business will be valued based on A, your earnings. Your earnings, let's say if you're a $10 million company and you make 15% uh, pre-tax, that's 1.5 million bucks. Now, EBITDA is earnings before income taxes, which we just took care of and depreciation and amortization. So let's say uh, for easy math, you add 150,000 to the million, million five, now you're at 1,650. Then there's a thing called non-recurring expenses and you business owners out there know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't have to, to tell you what they are, but they are things that the costs that occurred while you own the business that will not occur when you sell the business, they're non-recurring. So let's add 350 grand. Now you're at $2 million EBITDA. So if you take a multiple, it could be any as low as three, which I wouldn't ever recommend, or as high as seven, which you rarely get. So let's use five. So if you move $2 million EBITDA times five, a multiple of five, you get 10 million. But there's more. You have equity in the business. Let's say you have $2 million worth of equity in the business, and they want to keep 30% of that, 33%, whatever. It's like 600 grand. So now you can keep the 1.4 million, add it to your 10 million and you're at 11.4 million, okay? So that's, that's what you're gonna get in cash, but it gets better. You're gonna get that wired to your account on the day of closing, 90% of it, 10% they'll keep as a retainer against your non-compete, right? But, but that is what, that's how businesses are valued from the company's perspective, the companies, the buyers, that I deal with, the buyers that I will introduce you to. But that's why your receivables build up so much. Now, a company is going to look at receivables and, and they're going to count it, but they're going to, you know, they're going to have some kind of clawback for bad receivables, one thing. And, and I'm sure you can understand that. The second would be work in process. Now, work in process, again, <laughs> it's a, it's a um, completion contract way of, of taxes. But what that means is, at the breakoff point, whatever the closing date is, so let's say it's it's December 31st, you're going to have work in progress. Not every job ends December 31st. It's not like the retail outlet that closes their books on the at the end of the month and the numbers are what they are. Your value is based on your work in process, among many other things. But if you have a work in process of two million or say four million dollars, you're a ten million dollar company. So at any point in time, you have $4 million of active work going on. Could be 20 different jobs. You have to project where that job is going to come in at. What you're saying is if you, if you have a cost of X and you expect to spend Y, that gives you Z, which is your total cost at completion. That total cost of completion on a million dollar job, if it's 800,000, that means you expect to spend 800. If you spent four hundred thousand dollars at twelve thirty-one, that's the breakoff point. That means you have spent half of your cost, and therefore you can accrue half of your gross profit. So you have accrued a hundred thousand dollars in gross profit. Now, the job can go two ways, and again, it's an estimate; it's never perfect. But usually, there's some that go up and some that go down. But if there's a drastic deviation or variation in your work and process, projected at closing and the actual work in process 
let's say three or six months later, when those jobs that were in progress close, there will be, and that's why they have retainage, there will be a clawback. Now, what, what do I do? Part of what I do is make sure that you have a clause in the contract that says, if they perform better, that you'll get paid extra. Okay, so these are just some of the little things, but that's your basic deal. That's how it works. You get your money right away. They're gonna hold a little retainage. There's a honeymoon period where it's either gonna go up in a little bit or down a little bit. There's retention and that's the way it happens. Elevate, 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 elevate. So you may be asking a very common but important question. What will your role be after the sale? It's not gonna be a whole lot different than it was, except maybe your lifestyle will change, but you're still a very important part of the business. You're gonna run the business. Typically, they want two to three years, and that's negotiable. In particular, it's gonna depend on what kind of staff you have behind you, okay? But I would say the biggest differences are this. You're gonna be reporting results to somebody other than you. And to some people, that's hard. You know, it is what it is. They bought your business and they have the right to know what's going on. And once a month, you're going to report to them. I can tell you what won't happen. They're not going to be calling you every day. Hey, what did you sell? What did you sell? They don't have time for that, nor do they want to do that. They expect you to take care of business. The second thing, the transition, right? Uh, they're going to want to you to use their ERP, their enterprise platform, their software, basically. You're going to be, and it's, a, it's law, you're going to be on the same platform that they're on. You're going to report from the same set of books, uh, if that's another way of saying it. Other than that, it's business as usual. It's your business. You're still the face of the business. You're going to tell your customers. You're going to send them a letter saying, hey, I'm proud to announce that I sold my business to so-and-so. I'm also very thankful for the opportunity you've given me to build my business something I'll never forget. You also say that, and the good news is, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna be your guy, so it's business as usual. Thanks again. That's what you're gonna say. Now, when I sold my business, I was like, oh my God, people are gonna be pissed at me. No, they weren't. They were happy for me. They were. They were genuinely happy, especially when they found out that I was staying. Now, the staff, the staff is never gonna know that you're considering selling your business until, if and until you want to tell them. But a lot of people say, you know, what happens to my staff? I know this company is going to come in and they're going to fire everybody and shrink the, that's not what happens. That happens in the movies. That may happen with private equity firms. That's not going to happen with an external sale to a national company. The last thing they want to do is figure out how to run your business. You've done it, right? Even accounting, they, they may centralize accounting, but they're going to take your accountant and they're going to teach you to do something else. So you know, I've seen it happen. It happened to me. And I've never seen in any of the, the deals that I've been involved with, the company come in and clean house. It just doesn't happen. Now, how are your employees going to react? You know, it's going to vary. First and foremost, they should be happy for you. Number two, a lot of people, uh, <laughs> and this may come as a surprise to the owners, are going to be happy. Because now they even have more protection, right? They have more security because now they're part of a bigger company. It may mean for some people, right? Your management team, it may mean bigger opportunities. Now they're they're involved with a bigger company. So nothing wrong with working for you. They have for years, they help you build it and they help you get to where you want to go. But I didn't feel like I owed them anything except a good chance with a good company to do more. And that's what, that's what your employees are going to find. So how does the process work? It's totally confidential. The first thing you'll do is you'll sign with the, with the buyer a mutual non-disclosure agreement, and you'll probably get a simple questionnaire. That questionnaire is going to ask you for the trailing 12 months or for the year of whatever. How much did you do? What was your overhead? You know, give us, I don't want names. I want, I want positions. I have a general manager, an office, but they don't want names. They want to see how you're built. Then they'll come back with some questions. And, and I, at Adicorp Construction Services, LLC, this is what we do. We are the liaison. We know the buyers, but we'll get you to this point. So it's confidential. You, you share information under that, guys. And then uh, if, if you're a fit, 
and they'll know right away. So there's no big wasted time. It's not like, you know, hey, I've waited for three. No, they're going to look at your EBITDA. They're going to look at your business, their lines of business, the things I already mentioned. They're going to say, you know what? We like this person. We like this company. So they're going to offer a letter of intent. And all that, it's a non-binding letter of intent. The only thing it does, it stipulates the amount. You're going to like that. The terms. And again, don't discount the fact that you're going to make money working for this company after the fact. And you're going to be incentivized. So it's not like you get paid this and it all goes away. We had to do on the last deal, we had to do a spreadsheet for the owner to say, look, here's what you're getting now. Here's what it's going to be worth over time should you invest it at a minimal rate. Here's what you're going to make versus what your equity is and what, what your business is, is, is giving off right now. And it was a no brainer. Again, not for everybody, but if your timing is right, that's good. Once the LOI is accepted by you, you know, and again, that could take two weeks, three weeks. It could, it, it's quick because all they're saying is based on the information that you gave me, we're going to offer you this over this period of time. And your position is going to be this. This is what we're going to pay you. And this is how you're going to be incentivized. Now that's just the beginning. That's the beginning. If you accept it, that's when the due diligence starts. And what it means is they're going to ask your accountant if you have one. If not, I got a guy, right? They're going to ask your accountant to, to uh, answer some questions. You know, if you've done audits, it's an easy thing. If you've done reviews, it's not as easy, but it's simple, right? They're going to do due diligence without anybody knowing about it. Now, as you get further down the road, there's two things. That's a good thing, right? Because you're closer to closing. And the second thing is you may have to bring in a confidant, somebody on the inside who can help you gather more information. If you get to that point, you should be happy about it because you're getting close. Once they make the final offer, and again, that's where I come in. That's where my team comes in. We know how to stretch this. We know how to get the most for you. We know how to get it so you can keep the most of what you get. Uh, but if the final offer is accepted, then there's a transition plan, which includes when it's going to happen, when's closing, how you're going to tell your staff, right? What the transition is going to look like, how they're going to help you. Then there's the closing. It's going to be, it's going to be a day you'll never forget, whether it's, you know, a hundred grand or 10 million or more, right? That is a big deal. But the day of closing isn't the end. It's the beginning of a new chapter. And that's something I think if you embrace that, you know, a lot of people don't want to let go because of change. Don't let change get in the way. Change can be a good thing. You've already demonstrated you know how to build a business, right? Do you know how to sell one now? I hope this has helped. Last but not least, how long will this take? If you, from the first questionnaire to the finish, could be 90 days, maybe 120. And that, that's quick, but nobody has time to waste, especially you. I've seen deals stretch out for a year. And you know what it does? It distracts the heck out of you, the owner. That's not what anybody wants. So if the letter of intent happens, followed by the offer, followed by the acceptance, followed by the like, closing and the transition, I said, that can take anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Your life is different, but that could be a good thing. Elevate, elevate, elevate. All the music for the episodes, including our theme song, Elevate, was provided by DMV producer Trey Skills. If you like what you heard, follow Trey Skills on Instagram at Trey Skills, T-R-E-Y-S-K-I-L-L-Z. That's T-R-E-Y-S-K-I-L-L-Z. So follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Elevate Industry. Check out my YouTube channel at Commercial Construction, Elevate the Industry. Visit my website, adicorp.com, A-D-I-C-O-R-P.com. Go to LinkedIn, search for David Proceda, hit connect and follow me. Please rate, review, and comment on this episode. And I look forward to seeing you next week.